Hello ladies and gents, welcome to another video. Today I want to talk a little bit about the BGA reboarding process and show you how you can work around not having the correct BGA stencils for the chip that you're trying to replace on a motherboard. So while I'm at it, I also want to clear up a few common misconceptions that people seem to have and that people seem to be spreading around YouTube and other various different sites. So, first of all, we need to understand what a BGA chip is. And BGA simply stands for Ball Grid Array. And if we take a look at this little chip that I have in my hand, this is a RAM chip off of a, I believe it's a PS4. It's either a PS4 or an Xbox One. But this is essentially a BGA chip. And they all look pretty much the same. You've got various different ones. We've got a PS4 one just here. And this is one that I've actually been reboarding today by hand. Now I do have the correct stencil. I just like to practice whenever I've got an error free. And also, there are also various different other ones. This is one that I was just messing around with, seeing if a certain stencil fit the chip. This is an Xbox One, uh, an Xbox One S APU. So basically, yeah, it's. Uh, that's essentially a BGA, it's just a ball grid array, and it's basically just a grid of solder balls underneath the chip, and the solder balls make a contact with the motherboard, and that's how the chip is soldered to the board, basically. So, this is a BGA, essentially, in a nutshell. Um, this one, of course, that I'm going to be using for demonstration purposes today is a much smaller BGA. So, this is a RAM chip, like I said. Um, I can't remember what this come off. I think it, it was either off a PS4 or an Xbox One, uh, one of the two. But it's a RAM chip nonetheless, and I believe there are around about 90 balls on this. I'm not sure. I, I'm, I can't remember the exact count of them, but there's around about 90 balls on the on these chips, and I believe they are 0.45 millimeter in diameter uh, for the solder solder balls themselves. I'm not sure on the pitch. Now, the pitch is just the distance between two balls. So, for example, on a Xbox One, the APU for an Xbox One has a, milli has a pitch of 1mm, and the solder balls themselves are 0.55mm, I believe, or 0.6mm, one of the two. Now, one of the things that I usually do, a general rule of thumb for me, is for example if we have a BGA such as a PS4 APU or if we have a BGA such as a Southbridge chip on a PS4 what I tend to do is whatever the size of the solder ball I tend to go one step lower so the solder ball the solder balls on a PS4 APU are 0.55 millimeters and I'm not sure on the pitch on these, I can't remember off the top of my head, but I'll try and include it if I remember in the video. But basically, the reason that I go one step lower, so for example, 0.55 to 0.5 millimeter, is because if I'm reboiling by hand, I want as much room for error as I possibly can. And as long as all the balls are the same size, and as long as they make a contact with the pads on the board, then realistically, it doesn't matter what the size of the balls are. You could realistically, I mean, if you had a couple of years maybe, you could realistically run jumper wires to every single pad and then run those jumper wires to the corresponding pads on the APU. And it would work because you would be making that connection. So it doesn't really make a difference what size the actual balls are, like I said, as long as they're making a connection on the board. And... Like I said, I generally go one step lower, so if it's 0.55mm, I'll use 0.5mm balls, just to give myself that little bit more room for error, and a little bit more room to work with when I'm under the microscope and actually soldering the balls to the chip, or aligning the balls to the chip rather, because we don't solder them to start with, we get them aligned. And one of the common misconceptions about a BGA chip and soldering by hand or reboiling by hand is that you must have steady hands. Now, this is just simply not true. I do not have steady hands. 
and you will see that under the microscope. I swear I will not be putting anything on. But I can assure you I do not have steady hands. Now, my hands are fairly steady. You know, on the ca on camera now you can't really you can't really see any movement in my hands apart from when I'm actually talking. Um, but I do get the odd kind of like uh, like a random movement in my hand. So if I if I'm trying to concentrate on something, what I'll tend to do is every so often. So if I've got a pair of tweezers, for example, every so often, uh, let me just find a pair of tweezers. Okay, here's some tweezers. Here are the ones that I actually use for reboiling. Uh, so if if for example I'm trying to concentrate, I've got a tiny little solder ball inside the tweezers. Occasionally, you'll see my hand just go, you know, just nudge, nudge slightly, very, very slight, but it's it's still there. Now, like I said, that is a common misconception, with exception, and the exception is obviously if you have some sort of a nervous disposition, or you can't keep your hands steady, and you know they are literally all over the place. I mean, I do know, or I used to know one person. I think he's passed away now, but I used to know a person who had an accident. He was working and um, he basically, he was actually a big issue seller. So before he sold big issue, and the reason he started selling the big issue is because he had an accident at work and severed through the nerves in his hand. So he basically couldn't keep his hand steady and he, he literally was, you know, not, not, to, not trying to take the mic, he was a lovely man. And, um, you know, he was literally, you know, he was, he was like that all the time. He would constantly so obviously someone like that that couldn't do this. That's 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 obvious. However, you don't need the steadiest hands to do it, and uh, yeah, it, it's just one of them things. So like I say, the, this this person he he really did have unsteady hands. So people like that obviously can't you know can't do this sort of thing because if he's sitting there with a BGA chip trying to align the chip align the balls, he's going to be knocking them all over the place. So that's. You know that's obvious but someone like me who doesn't have steady hands but they're steady enough sort of thing and like i said it is a common misconception you don't need very steady hands you know you can there, there, there is room to room to you know make a couple of mistakes and if you do make a mistake you know it's not going to be a major mistake it's going to be like probably five or ten balls um and yeah it's uh it's one of them things so uh, another misconception is that you can't do it with hot air. Now that again is not true, because as long as you can as as long as you can adjust the airflow on your machine, you can do it with hot air. And as long as you control that temperature, you can do it with hot air. So the hot air gun that I'm using right now is an Atom ST Dash 862D. Brilliant machine. You can control the airflow and you can control the heat. And I'm actually using, as you can see, an angled nozzle. And this nozzle is great, especially for doing this kind of work. Because basically, the if you're under the microscope and you're trying to, you know, heat the chip up so as you can solder the balls on, you know, you can have it like this and just, you know, like spread it around and you can, have, or you can have it up ways and do it on an angle. You know, there are several different ways you can do it. And... Uh, the bigger the nozzle, the worse you're going to get. Okay, so you can't do it with a nozzle like this because you're just going to have airflow all over the place and it's just going to blow everything out of the way. Mm -hmm. Now, when you do do it with hot air, of course, you're going to need to take it steady. So what you do in that situation when you don't have, for example, a mm -hmm. rework station, an expensive rework station, because those things are not cheap. Mm -hmm. I mean, I brought mine, I've got a Achi IR Pro SC, and I purchased mine second hand and that cost me four hundred pound. And that was collected from London. Bear in mind I live in the West Midlands, I live in Wolverhampton. Mm. And I had to travel to London to get that for four hundred pounds. It's not a cheap machine. It's it's around about nine hundred to a thousand pounds to buy, mm. uh, brand new. And the only reason I bought one second hand is because I just simply didn't have the money to buy one brand new. It took me, you know, it took me several weeks of putting little bits of money away uh, to be able to afford to buy this machine because, you know, I wanted to get into rework. I wanted to get into the BGA rework side of it and learn myself. And since I've purchased that machine, it's saved me so much time and money. 
and I've, I've obviously done a lot of BGA rework on it but the main thing that I do on it is remove things like HDMI ports or chips that have a large ground plane uh, but now I've brought this uh, this Atten heat uh, rework station or Atten hot air station uh, you know I don't need to do it for that because this makes mincemeat of HDMI ports and ground planes it really does it's absolutely insane how hot this thing gets and how quick and how controlled and accurate the temperature is but anyway I'm going slightly off topic with this so yeah um, what, like I said the, the other misconception is you can't use hot air when in actual fact you can and I, and I have on several occasions used hot air and in fact on the PS4 APU which I'm reboiling um, that is actually done a lot by hot air and I have not popcorn the chip the chip is absolutely fine and yeah it's uh, this is actually going to be part of a project where I'm going to try and do an APU swap and there's a lot more chips to rebore but yeah that's uh, that's for another day so be sure to look out for that um, so a couple of days ago the reason I'm making this video is because there are so many videos out there that show this process but the problem is with this process is that these videos are not showing you exactly how to do it they're not talking you through how to do it they're not talking you through the tips the tricks the best practices um, the things that work for them and there really are no best practices as long as it works for you and I believe it was Lewis Rossman I saw do this a couple of months ago on a video it was actually an older video of his it's a few years old where he was reborn on a chip and the the chip itself had a couple of missing balls and he was placing them by hand using hot air uh, so that's one way that you could do it you could you could sit there and place every one by hand and solder them individually one at a time if you really wanted to it's going to take you a lot longer especially when you're working with something like a PlayStation 4 Southbridge which has 400 0.5 millimeter solder balls or 0.6 millimeter solder balls uh, I can't remember the exact specs of it but uh, it would take you forever if you're doing something like that or for example a Xbox One Southbridge uh, which has got 508 solder balls and I've done those by hand as well and they are uh, they're, they're not easy but they you know it is possible and that's why I wanted to make this video um, but there's so many videos out there where they're just playing some stupid rock music um, or some some stupid techno music and they don't give you an explanation as to how it's done mm. so hopefully we can do that today so before we actually get started the other day I did actually record the entire process of reboiling an Xbox, a PS4 Southbridge so 400 solder balls and I reboiled that completely by hand I didn't talk over it so I'll just you know it took me around about an hour to do and you know I'm not going to make you sit through an hour of video so I'm going to play that now I'll show you that in action and then I'll walk you through it on this smaller chip so enjoy this little time lapse and I'll see you in a minute
right, so I hope you enjoyed that little time lapse there of me reboarding that PS4 safe bridge. So one of the reasons that I'm doing this video is because I sent the I sent the pictures of that safe bridge after I'd reboarded it and during the process to quite a few technician friends, and they all seemed fairly interested in it. And I also posted it to my YouTube community tab, and people seem to take an interest in it. So you know there seems to be a lot of a lot of interest in this sort of area and hopefully this is going to be something that's going to help you to understand the process the time frames and things like that and talking about time frames um there's really no and talking about time frames there's really no guide that i can give you other than it depends on your speed and it depends on how steady you are and how concentrated you are so personally myself it takes me around about 15 minutes for each 100 balls depending on the depending on how the array is made up so if for example we have a ps4 safe bridge so such as uh, sorry a ps4 apu so something like this it's going to take a little bit longer because the the balls are a little bit more spread out however on a PS4 Southbridge, for example, it's a 20 by 20 array, and all of the balls are in a little square like this. So it's not going to take as long because you know you can just move from one to the next to the next to the next to the next. And uh, it, it really all depends on the chip itself. And like I said, a PS4 Southbridge roughly takes me around about 15 minutes per 100 balls, so around about an hour to do the entire reball by hand. Now, I do have little stencils for the PS4 Southbridge, however it's tiny and the only way that i can use it is by using this little reboiling jig so this is kind of like a little a little adjustable spring loaded jig and what you do is you put your chip inside here so say for example this was the chip you was reboiling it would be you'd put it in there and then you place the chip on the top or place the stencil on the top and pressure would hold it in but the problem with that is you've got to heat the actual stencil up itself. Now, I don't like doing that because it, it does wear the stencils out over time. So what the way I prefer to do it is to either use a spring-loaded jig or to do it by hand. Now, what I mean by a spring-loaded jig is something along the lines of what I have here, which is this thing. So ignoring the fact that the other handle's missing, it's around somewhere. Uh, but this is basically a spring loaded jig so what you do is you take your stencil so this is this is obviously the top to this one but you take the top you put it on top like that you put all your balls on and then once all your balls are on you'd push the actual bottom of it down so you see how the you see how that pushes down but these bars here stay where they are so these bars are fixed and what that does is it allows you to push it down like this. All the balls are supposed to stay in place. And then you'd lift the, as you're coming back up. So you, you have it like this. And that, as you're coming back up, so I push that down now. And as you're coming back up, you can grip it like this. And if you take a look at that. So you see how it forms a gap. So that's a spring loaded jig. And... The top, the top to this one's around somewhere as well. Um, I've recently rearranged my desk a little bit. Uh, well, my entire workshop actually, and uh, yeah, I just can't find anything. I cannot find anything at the minute. This is a good little, a good little uh, reboiling jig. And basically, what you do with this, you put your chip in here, you tighten it up, so you adjust it to the size you need, and then you place this on top. And obviously, then what you can do is place all your balls in, give it a little shake, tip all your excess out, and then just lift the top off. Um, or you can obviously use heat, use a heat gun, melt them while it, while the stencil's there, keep them all in place, and then lift it off. But the problem with that, like I said, is it wears the stencils out. Now, getting back to the reboiling by hand, why would you want to reboil by hand when you can get a stencil? Well, the truth is, when you if you're doing what I do, if you're if you're doing repairs on behalf of customers, so if you're doing this as a profession, then sometimes you're going to get stuck. You're basically going to get caught in the moment, and you're not going to have the right stencil. So you can get things like this. So these are universal stencils with different 
ball diameters and different pitch sizes so you can buy stuff like this and there are hundreds of these that you can get however sometimes these are just no good and this is what i mean by uh by actually you know burning a stencil out uh, so this is a xbox 360 gpu and this is obviously for the old gpus on the xbox 360s and look at what it does to it and also over time it will warp the warp the uh, stencil as well so i don't like using heat now what what you can do in terms of the in terms of the universal stencils if you don't have the correct one is you can mask it off now this is one that i've masked off this is these are 90 by 90 millimeter stencils and these fit perfectly onto here so same with this one 90 by 90 millimeter stencil and if we take the xbox xbox one s uh apu so i'm going to get rid of these solder balls off here so there we go that's magic so basically what i was doing with this earlier was i was just trying to find the right stencil because i can't find a stencil even anywhere online that fits the xbox one apu so i had a look through my universal stencil set and managed to find one so what i did was i placed the chip inside the stencil so you can see that that's nice and tight in there now and i essentially just went like this so you can see here it does line up um in a certain way yeah, there we go so you can see here that this lines up absolutely perfectly and what i did was i masked off the rest of this the rest of this stencil so basically whatever i put in here now so if i was to tip some solder balls in here now so for example some 0.5 millimeter balls i'm not going to put much in because i haven't got whoops i haven't got many um i'm waiting for some to come i'll say i'm not going to put much in and i'll still put probably 3000 in um so you'd basically, you know, you'd shake it around like this, and I'm not going to do it properly. You'd shake it around like this, you'd tip all your excess out, and then you'd just lift it off, and the solder balls will go on there. Now, these are the wrong size. There is a few that's gone through, but I didn't do that properly. Uh, but, uh, yeah, that's essentially reboiling. But, like I said, the problem is you're going to end up with balls where you don't want balls to go. And you can mask them off. Like this one I did for the... Um, the PS4 Southbridge and that's a 20x20 20 20 array and then I mask the rest off with some copper tape um, yeah I've got a big reel of copper tape I haven't got much captain tape so I'll just use copper tape instead uh, so you can do that however it's not really you know it, it's not really uh, it's not really a very good design is it so sometimes we like to reball by hand and especially if there's not many solder balls there so for example something like that a ram chip i think there's around about 90 90 balls on there and um, by the time we've sat there and found a stencil to match and then basically sat there and masked everything else off you know we could have done this this could be done you know 10 15 minutes this ram chip is re is, is reballed so for example you've got uh water damage under a ram chip and you need to replace it on a console or on a motherboard with soldered on ram then you know by the time you've masked masked the universal stencil off you, you've done the job once you once you're efficient enough at it uh so yeah that's uh that's one of the reasons we'd use uh we do it by hand um but anyway let let's stop talking now let's actually show you how to do this so i'm going to pop this inside the stencil so i'm going to have to close this quite a bit and what i'm also going to have to do is just clean out my and i said stencil then i meant jig uh, so what i'm going to have to do is clean this out and i'm going to have to get rid of all of this leftover flux and stuff from the from the last reboard i did so i'm just going to use some isopropyl alcohol and a toothbrush just get rid of some of this gunk around here because it's not very nice on your hands you don't want this stuff on your hands it's not good for you and if it gets inside your skin it could cause problems later on in life uh, what i tend to do is every few days with this what i what i'll usually do is i'll put it inside the ultrasonic cleaner so i'll take it all apart take all of these off you know disassemble it into like five or six pieces and just ultrasonic clean it because it just it does get pretty gunked up and uh it's not nice to hold and handle uh so yeah just uh, try and keep it clean uh, I don't do it after every reball, probably every two or three, to be honest. Depending on 
how bad it is and how long it took me to reboil it and how many attempts. Uh, so sometimes what you'll find is when you actually heat it up afterwards, you'll find that a couple of balls will merge and you'll have to wick them off and redo them and things like that. It can be a bit of a pain in the backside, but, um, you know, once you get proficient at it, then, you know, it, it's a breeze. It really is. So let's get rid of the IPA. Let's get this chip inside the stencil. So let's close it up. I'm going to need this fairly close together. And then this doesn't quite fit inside here. But it fits enough. <clears throat> so there we go. So that just about fits in there. It's a very small chip. There's not many balls on there. And I think they are 0.45mm. Uh, I'm not 100% sure. I only took these off. I've never... Um, actually, yes, I have. I've reboiled RAM... But I used a universal stencil and I think I used solder paste. So I don't know the size of these, if I'm honest. Um, I think they're 0.45mm. I'm not 100% sure. But if they're not, if they're smaller than 0.45mm, then yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll just find another chip. Um, but yeah, let's get under the microscope and we'll, we'll show you how this is done, shall we? Alright, so here you can see that we've got the chip in the jig and you can see also that this chip has just come off of a board. Uh, so this is what the, this is roughly what the chip will look like when it comes off the board. Uh, we've got another one just here. Uh, and as you can see, the sol there's still solder on the balls or on the pads. Uh, we've got to get rid of it. So the way to do that is to simply wick it off. And I prefer to use goot wick because it's just really good wick. It absorbs a lot of copper, and it it yeah it's it's just it's just the best in my opinion. Um, everyone will have their preference on what wick to use, but I prefer to use goot wick. So that's what I'm going to be using. And all we're going to do is we're going to use a soldering iron and wick this off using the solder wick. I mean, if you're thinking about going into reboiling, then you probably already know what wick is and you probably already have a preference um i prefer to use goot wick it's cheap it's reliable and it's i can get it in the uk so uh that's my preference so what i'm going to do i've got my soldering iron so i'm just going to heat that up it doesn't take long to heat my soldering iron up and if we take a look you'll see that i've got a fairly big tip on here and obviously as you can see it's pretty big in respect to the chip itself Let's just try and get that chip centred. There we go. So you'll see that I've got a fairly big tip on here. And the reason I've got a fairly big tip is because I want to get a lot of surface area. So I want to get these ball, these this old solder off quickly and easily. So all we're going to do is we're going to use the goot wick or whatever wick you choose to use. And we're just going to wick away. And you see just how easily that comes off. Very nice indeed. So we want to get these pads as flat as we can possibly get them. And you can see the, that this chip is probably a bad example because it's fairly unsteady inside the jig. Because this is the tightest this jig will go. And uh, it's fairly unsteady but we can still work with it. And this is going to apply to pretty much any chip. Uh, you, it doesn't matter what it comes from. It doesn't matter where it comes from. It doesn't matter what size it is. You know, this this method applies to every single chip, um, regardless of size of the solder balls, regardless of size of pitch, uh, regardless of the size of the chip and how many balls there is. You can do any chip by hand without the stencil. It does not matter. Um, now, obviously, <laughs> there's going to be some common sense exceptions. So, first common sense exception, you're not going to sit there and reboot an Xbox One APU by hand. It's going to take forever. Um, and that's why I was trying to find a universal stencil, because it is going to take forever. Uh, there's around about 1,400 balls on a on an Xbox One APU. About the same for the PS4. Um, and you're really not going to want to do it by hand. The only reason I'm doing a PS4 one by hand is for practice. Uh, and even then I'm just doing a little bit at a time because I don't have that much time free. Um, if you work it out at around about an hour for, 100, for 400 balls, 
then you're talking around about probably four to five hours to do an Xbox One APU or the PS4 APU. So, yeah, it's really not viable at all. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to just clean off the chip. So I'll get rid of all of this flux that's been left over by the wick because the wick does have flux already on the uh, on the wick. And that's what helps it to absorb the solder. Uh, and you're going to see that we've got a couple of oxidised pads. So what I'm going to do is where we've got some oxidised pads, so where you can see they're darker, I think they're oxidised, I hope they're not missing. Uh, but I think they're just oxidised and um, they're going to need restoring. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to swap to a smaller tip now, now that we've got the majority of the solder off. So you'll see that this tip here is a lot smaller. Um, still the same design, but it's a lot smaller. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a little bit of flux just to this area here. Uh, because we want these pads. In fact, let's uh, let's just do let's just do all of them. Let's refresh every pad because we we want to give the solder balls as much of an opportunity to stick to the pads as we possibly can. So what I'm going to do in this situation, because we've got some oxidized pads, and you can do this anyway. This is just the best practice, really. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to apply some solder to the tip of the iron, and I'm just going to pre-tin all of these pads. And you might see these solder balls here and think, oh yeah, that's job done. But it's not. Because these solder balls are going to be uneven. They're going to be, you know, random in size. You're going to have one bigger than the other. And, you know, it, you can't you can't do it like this. Um, well, you, theoretically, yes, you could. However, it's not viable. It's going to take far too long. And you don't want to do it like this. So... Just apply some solder to all of these pads. Be careful not to pull these pads off. Because if you pull these pads off, you've either got to scrape back at the chip and restore the pads, or you've got to find a new chip. And if the chip is something like an APU, uh, or a chip that's married to the board, such as the uh, such as the little NAND the, on the PS4. So if you've got to reball that, if you're doing an APU swap, you know, you, you're stuffed because that chip is married to the board, it's married to the APU. If you're doing an APU swap, then you're going to be basically um, having to swap every single chip. And if you get one chip wrong, then it's, it's not going to work. And if you pull a pad and you can't restore it, you're kind of in, uh, in deep water there. So let's just apply some solder to all of these pads. Now, I obviously don't care about ripping a pad on this because this chip has just come off for de demonstration purposes. Uh, however, you know, it, it's it's best practice to try and not rip the pads, of course. Um, so I'm going to try my best not to rip them for the demonstration purposes of this video. Uh, if you find that one of these pads won't tin, just give it a scrape. Uh, put a little bit of extra pressure on it and you'll see that it will tin eventually, as long as the pad hasn't been ripped up. But all of those pads are tinned and now we're just going to wick away once again. You can do this before you wick at all. So you don't need to wick first and then add solder afterwards. You can just do this and replace the solder that's on there with leaded solder. Or what, or even lead-free solder if, if that's what you prefer to use. If you're using lead-free solder, so be it. But leaded solder is much better. Okay, so my wick has decided to go hard because I've just used a soldering iron on it once. So I'm going to go ahead and cut this off. And get a fresh piece of wick. So that's that. And uh, I'm going to wick away at these at these pads. So it's kind of difficult with this chip because, like I said, it doesn't fit inside the stencil. Inside the, it doesn't fit inside the actual jig itself. So it's a little bit difficult with this one. But yeah, it's uh, it's still doable. And that, there's still one pad which is, there we go. Same for this. So you can see my hand there as well. When we're under the microscope, I'm not putting that on. My hand is on the table. I'm genuinely not putting that on. But when I get, when I get into concentration mode, it will steady up. So I'm genuinely holding that 
You know, my hand is on the table. My hand is not steady, okay? I am not putting that on, genuinely. And that's a fraction of a movement. You know, I'm, I'm under the microscope and I'm zoomed in probably, I don't know, probably 10x. So, you know, I'm genuinely not putting that on. That's not much movement and you can't see that by eye. But because I'm zoomed in so much with the microscope, you can see it. And you can clearly see it. And that might make you nervous. But honestly, don't worry. Because it's not really going to affect it too much. So we're just going to get rid of all of these solder, the, all of these solder balls on here. Um, just refresh these pads so as they're nice and clean, just like so. Uh, but yeah, genuinely, my hands are that unsteady, and they're not, you know, they're not perfect. So that's the misconception, just completely debunked. Um, I apologise for knocking the camera there. Uh, yeah. So like I said, it's. Uh, it's not true, you don't need very steady hands for this. So we're just going to clean up the chip now. And you can see we've got some nice shiny pads here now. So let's add a bit more IPA to this. Make it as clean as we can possibly make it because one of the reasons that we get a blue light of death on a PS4 is because of the way that they were put on the board at the factory. So there was a lot of debris and stuff underneath the chip and over time that caused them to have a blue light of death. And we want this chip as clean as we can possibly get it. So, you know, you're not going to sit there cleaning too much. It's uh, you, you genuinely you want this as clean as you can possibly get it and uh, as flat as you can get those balls as well, those pads. So, I'm going to get this nice and dry, get rid of any IPA, any kind of debris. And you can see we've got a really nice clean chip here now. And I'll just turn the light down a little bit, so we can see it a little bit better. So, one problem with using the stencil underneath, or using the jig underneath the microscope camera is that the light bounces off it. So the microscope light, the ring light on the microscope bounces off the aluminium. And when I, turn, when I turn the light up so as I can see through the eyepiece, it uh, it just reflects, and uh, you can't you can't see you can't see anything on the actual chip itself, on the actual camera itself. So uh, I'm going to have to work on low light. So my vision um, for a start, I'm using the Microsoft camera, so I'm using my right eye, and that's my weak eye. Um, so my vision is going to be slightly impaired also the zoom level for me is not as high as it is for you so that's another thing and uh i think i might have um have i accidentally yeah so i've accidentally exposed a little bit of the conformal coating there but that's not too much of a problem what you can do in that situation is you can use something like this so this here is solder mask uh, now I don't know where my UV light is like I said I've rearranged the workshop uh, but you can apply a little bit of solder mask now this is uh, this obviously isn't going onto a board this is just for an example so I'm not going to bother anyway but you can apply a little bit of solder mask and it really wouldn't take a lot by the way you know the very tiniest amount um, so I'll give you an example of that so I'm going to pop a little bit onto my tweezers So as you can see here, I've got a little bit on the tweezers and it really wouldn't take a lot. But that is all it would take. And then you just put a, put a little bit of UV mask over that. It'd be the same for this one here. Uh, now obviously the bigger the pads are, the less likelihood you are going to be of actually doing this. However, you will need UV mask as one of your supplies um, because if this happens you're going to need to obviously protect it from you know shorting it shorting out on another chip on another uh, on another solder ball uh, so yeah uh, obviously for the sake of this video we're not going to do that 
Um, I don't know where my UV pen is, so yeah, but it's not necessary for this video, so we're not going to worry. So the next thing we're going to need is solar flux, and I use Kingbo RMA218, and uh, yeah, it's flux is flux to me. Um, you know, I'm not paying twenty pound for for a tube of for for a tube of Amtec. It gets washed away anyway, as long as you clean the board okay and you've got some sort of decent fume extraction. You know, flux is flux. Come on. Uh, just make sure you clean the board properly. Uh, so like I said, the next thing we're going to need is flux. And the reason we're going to need this is to allow these balls to have a nice shiny finish. And to allow them to also adhere to the chip. So we're going to add some little blobs of flux onto the chip. Not too much. There we go. That should be plenty. Now, like I said, you don't want to get this stuff on your hands. So use a cotton swab and basically just spread this flux around. So I'm going to try and use a microscope because it's a little bit awkward for me. And uh, we might need a little bit more than this, but... Uh, yeah, maybe a tiny bit more. No, actually, you know what? That's probably plenty uh, uh let's leave, let's use a little bit more why not so the problem with using a cotton swab is you're going to get little bits of fluff and things on the actual tip itself so you're going to want to make sure you clean those off um i do actually use my finger to spread this around so basically all you do is just wipe it around make sure it's nice and evenly spread and you really don't need much just a really thin layer just spread that across the chip And then obviously, like I said, just wipe, just wipe your finger off afterwards. Uh, wash it with isopropyl alcohol, whatever you want to do. Um, isopropyl alcohol also isn't very good for your skin. That's why I've got, you know, cracked, cracked, thing, cracked, uh, cracked skin around my finger. Uh, but uh, yeah, it, it's better than better for you than than the fluxes. So flux obviously contains a lot more chemicals than isopropyl alcohol. So I'll just, I'll just tend to wash my hand off with isopropyl alcohol afterwards uh, just to get it off my skin because IPA is very good at, at cleaning flux off. So now that we've got some flux on the board, on the chip, like I said, we don't need a lot. Just a very nice, thin, even coat and that should be absolutely plenty. Next thing we're going to need, of course, is the right size solder balls. So as far as I know, this is going to be 0.45mm balls. And what we're going to do is we're just going to take a few of these and just tip them onto the chip itself. So all we're going to do is just knock a few of these out. And we don't want too many because these are very small and it's very easy to waste them. And of course when you've got flux on these, you don't really want to be putting them back in the tub. It's going to make them all stick together. So these are all 0.45mm balls that I've just put on here. And... What we're going to do is we're just going to spread them out and you'll see that some of them will stick to the tweezers so what i tend to do there is just run my tweezers across the side of the chip itself and just get rid of that so i just spread them out a little bit and you, you see there i actually did um, what i was talking about earlier is you know i'll get these random little movements where you know, I'll be concentrating and then all of a sudden my hand will just move randomly and uh, yeah, it's uh, it's one of those things I can't help but I'm still able to do this so I'm pretty sure you will be too. So all we're going to do basically is just move all of these chips into position and get them all on top of the sole, on top of the pads themselves and you'll see that while I'm actually doing this, because of the confidence that I've got and this is all it boils down to really is confidence. Because of the confidence I've got, you know, I'm able to put these in position and keep a fairly steady hand. Um, and while you'll notice where my finger is as well, it's very close to the tip of the actual, uh, very close to the tip of the tweezers. And what you'll notice is that because my hand is so close to the edge of the tweezers, and I'm also resting it on the jig itself, I'm able to keep a steady hand. Now, obviously, my hand is still moving a little bit, but I'm able to keep it fairly steady. And 
basically what we're going to do is we're just going to move all of these into position you're not going to have to go this slow i'm just doing this for example just to show you and obviously i'm going to speed a little bit of this up but i want to basically guide you through it and guide you through what what we're actually doing so like i said we're just going to push these into position and what they'll do because we've got these pads nice and flat these balls will actually sit fairly well on the pads so i'm going to stop talking for a second and just show you what will happen when i do move one into position quickly so in three two one i'm going to take this ball and you'll see that it sits fairly closely to the center of the pad now all we've got to do in that situation is just nudge it it's very simple and you don't have to have them perfect like if, you, if you've got the odd solder ball you know where you've moved the chip and you've got the odd solder ball for example there you know you can still see a bit of that pad when we put heat on this it's going to move into position surface tension is going to want to pull that ball into the center of the pad so you know you you can you've got room for error you don't have to be absolutely perfect and dead center but if you do want to get it dead center just keep nudging it you know it, it's not going to be it's not it's never going to be absolutely perfect and if we we can zoom right in here you know if you've got a good microscope and you really want to get down and dirty with this you know you can get down and dirty with it and really get these very close however what i've what i tend to find is the closer i get to them the more errors i make so because i basically think that i've got more room than i actually have and occasionally i'll slip and i'll knock a ball and it'll just knock out of place uh, in that situation you just nudge it back in um but you can be, if you've got a good microscope and you've got a good microscope camera and i'll leave a link to this microscope camera i paid 85 pound for this and the microscope i've got is an amscope and it's not a trinocular it's not got a trinocular port so there's no room for a camera on there uh, however i have converted one of the eyepieces and that's the reason that i have to use my right eye to be able to look under the microscope and use the camera at the same time because it's fairly difficult to look up um with your neck on an angle uh you know like in an up in an upwards position it's fairly difficult to look up at a screen and still be able to have that that you know accuracy that we need um, so realistically all you need for this is good hand-eye coordination and um, basically it's uh, yeah that's all you need is just good hand-eye coordination um, and with practice you know you're going to get these you're going to get these into position fairly quickly and you see there where I nudged that and my hand did slip a little bit you see it bouncing back so if you're fairly close you know it's going to bounce back um, if you've got a nice flat pad it's going to bounce into position and it's going to bounce fairly close uh, so for example you know i'll just i'll just go through a few of these you know at speed uh, or not at speed but i'll just do it a little bit quicker and i won't talk and i'll just go through the process Okay, and you'll notice there that some of the balls are sticking together. And I apologise, that is a bit out of focus. So let's go, let's just get back in focus there. There we go. So you'll notice that a few of the balls are sticking, or rather most of the balls are sticking together. And the reason for that is because we've got flux on the chip. And occasionally you'll find that one of the one of the solder balls will stick to the tweezers, like I said. And uh, yeah, like I said, just uh, rub, your, rub your tweezers across the chip. And it will come off. So just like that, that's stuck to the stuck to the tweezers. You know, just flick. You know, like I said, there's room for error. You you know, you can bounce around, and you know, you're not you're not really going to hurt anything as long as you're going in the right direction. So you'll notice that the the balls that I've put on the chip already are on the right hand side, and I'm working from right to left because I'm left-handed. Now, obviously, if you're right-handed, 
you know, I'm not going to be able to do this with my right hand. So I've got my, I've got the tweezers in my right hand now, and there is no way on earth I am going to use my, I am going to be able to use my right hand for this. Oh, actually, maybe I could with practice. Uh, no, <laughs> definitely not. So you'll notice I knocked a couple out of the way there. Um, so use the hand that you're most comfortable with because this essentially, like I said, boils down to a couple of things. Number one is confidence. So have confidence in your ability and have confidence in the fact that you can do this and have confidence in the fact that it is possible. And also good hand-eye coordination. So you're probably not going to be able to do this by eye. You're probably going to be able to use, going to be going to need to use a microscope. Now, if you can't afford a microscope, bear in mind I paid four hundred pound for my microscope. No, three hundred pounds, sorry, for my microscope. Um, again, I bought it used, but it was virtually brand new. Uh, the guy who brought it brought it because he wanted to get into micro soldering, couldn't do it, and ended up becoming a door bouncer. <laughs> so. Um, he sold me his microscope for three hundred pound. Um, it's a double, it's a double boom arm and scope, uh, and that's the only reason I didn't get the one with the trinocular port. And at the time, I wasn't doing YouTube videos, so uh, when I got into repair, I bought this one. Um, and yeah, it's it served me well. So you're going to need a microscope. However, you know, getting into this business is fairly expensive. I mean, the equipment I've got now is worth a fair few thousand pounds, and to buy that kind of stuff up front when you first start is scary because, you know, it's expensive, it's not cheap. And if you can't afford a microscope, and you can't afford a rework station, um, which, you know, um, I'm in the same boat, I'm not rich, I don't make, I don't make a mint, uh, I, make, I make a nice wage, I make a nice earning off this, but I don't make... You know, I'm not making ten thousand pound a week. Let's put it that way. Um, I'm not making a thousand pound a week. So, uh, yeah, um, if you can't afford, if you can't afford to, you know, buy the expensive equipment such as a microscope, the microscope, microscope camera, the um, extra lenses, all the sensors, and you want to do this just as a hobby, or if you want to just get into this and practice. You know, if you've got, uh, I'm not sure about Apple, but if you've got an Android phone, there's an app that you can use called Cozy Magnifier. And, you know, obviously this video is not sponsored by anyone, but Cozy Magnifier is what I used to do HDMI ports before I actually got into this full time. And what I would do is I had a USB-C to HDMI converter for my phone. And I'd basically use Cozy Magnifier and hook my phone up to a monitor using HDMI and then use a mount and basically I had a cheap microscope a very cheap microscope uh, because I already had the phone so the phone I use is a Samsung Galaxy S9 I've had it since launch um, and you know I used Cozy Magnifier along with a HDMI converter the HDMI converter cost me I think it was around about £14 on Amazon you can get them much cheaper on eBay, but I wanted one there and then because I'm impatient. And I basically turned my phone into a microscope. Uh, you know, I obviously already had the TV or the monitor rather. Um, I already had the phone, and I brought a mount for which is the same mount that I'm using now. And I brought a mount for I think it, I can't remember. I think it was around about ten to twelve pound. Uh, and I bought the the USB-C converter, uh, so around about £25. And um, basically, I had a microscope for around about £25. So if you can't afford to buy the expensive equipment, then don't buy the expensive equipment. You know, you can get by. You can, if you can do this by eye, if you've got the eyesight for it, great. Personally, I haven't, so I wouldn't. I can't even do a HDMI port without using a microscope. Uh, unless I use pure hot air to do it, and even then I've still got to use a microscope to make sure that all the pins are aligned. Um, I have done it by eye before, but it's not easy for me at all. And uh, yeah, um, you know, for around about £25 or around about €30, US, you know, you too can have a cheap microscope, and you don't need, like I said, the expensive equipment. Um, 
The soldering iron I'm using now is a TS100, which is meant as a hobbyist soldering iron, a portable hobbyist soldering iron. And you know what? It's absolutely fantastic. Um, I can't fault it. Um, I've only had it about a week, and I absolutely love it. I don't know why I didn't buy one a couple of years ago when that was released, because it's it's absolutely unbelievable for the price. It cost me £52, and I've paid about £25 on extra tips. Um, the heat gun that I'm using, like I said, is an, is an Atten ST862D. That cost me, I think it was €180. Euros. And that only came on Friday, and it's the best heat gun I've ever seen. Um, now, I don't have many heat guns for comparison, but it's absolutely fantastic. Um, and apparently, it beats the quick. So, again, it doesn't. you don't need expensive equipment. Now, obviously, the heat gun and the soldering iron are going to set you back a bit. But the heat gun comes with four nozzles. I paid extra for the, for the angled nozzles, for the 45 degree angled no nozzles. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's it's fairly cheap in terms of heat guns. Now the first heat gun I had was a um, which one was it? Now it was a cheap it was a cheap Chinese one. I can't remember can't remember the exact one, and I still have it. It's around somewhere, but uh, that cost me £150 and it was really, really bad. I've had to replace the soldering iron four times and I've had to replace the heat gun twice. And last week it eventually died. Luckily, I was already waiting for my replacement. So, yeah. Um, right, so one thing you'll notice here is I'm not really being too fussy. I'm not really paying too much attention to whether these are actually centre or not. And you'll see in a minute that it doesn't really matter too much. Uh, so, a little tip that I can give is don't fuss over the little things. So, let's say, for example, you have placed all your solder balls on the... You've placed all your solder balls onto the, uh, onto the middle of the chip, ready to align them. Um, and you've got a few solder balls lying on the chip. That are in 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 exact exactly the right position like this. So let's say, for example, you have them in exact, exactly the right position like that. You know, leave them there. Just leave them because they're already in place, and that's one less ball that you've got to place. And when you're doing four, five, six hundred balls, you know, <laughs> they add up. Trust me, they really do add up. Now, if you find you find yourself struggling like that, for example, when you're moving another ball into position, just move it up one. Just move it up one. Don't move it up like five or six. Leave it there until you start to until it starts to get in the way, and then move it to the closest closest pad where it's not going to get in your way. Um, so, like I said, you'll notice that I'm not being too fussy over whether these balls are dead centre, because surface tension, like I said, is going to want to pull these balls in, and you'll notice sometimes that. Your balls are going to sit there and stick to the end of the tweezers. So what I've just done is I've wiped the tweezers. So I've just got rid of any excess flux on the tweezers. And you'll notice now that it's going to be a bit easier to move these without them sticking sticking to the edge of the tweezers. Because I've just wiped the tip of the tweezers. And one thing that I do sometimes, until they get completely ruined. Uh, one thing that I'll do is I'll use an old pair of tweezers that... I've got the, you know, the uh, the tweezers are bent, you know, so there's a little bend in the tweezers. And what I'll do is I'll just snip the edge off those tweezers. And then I'll bend the tweezers. So if I've got the tweezers like this, um, so I nearly knocked all of the balls out of the way then. So if I've got the tweezers like this, I'll bend them outways, you know, so as they're basically stretched out and they're further apart in the natural position. And the reason I'll do that is because then, if you're using just one tweezer, the other tweezer's not going to get in the way as much. So the other tweezer should always be above the tweezer that you're using to move them into position. However, sometimes it is going to get in your way. So if you're like on an angle, if you've got a ball stuck to the... Let's just try and get one stuck to the, uh, to the tweezers. It's not going to stick to the tweezers now because I've cleaned them off. 
Come on, stick to the tweezers. Come on, there we go. So let's say, for example, if you if you're holding your tweezers like this and you want to get this ball off and it won't come off, sometimes you'll need to manipulate the tweezers. And I am terribly sorry, but <laughs> you couldn't see any of that. Uh, yeah. Um, so, like I said, if you have a ball stuck to the edge of the tweezers and that ball won't come off, so say, for example, it's on the side, you need you need to manipulate those tweezers. You know, you're going to be moving the tweezers around and you're going to be, you're going to place them on top of the chip and you're going to be, you know, just like that. And sometimes you're going to knock the balls. Uh, so if they're further apart, then you know it's going to make it easy to manipulate those tweezers. So yeah, let's just uh, let's just carry on here. So I apologise for missing a little bit of this here. Um, I'm under the microscope and I can't see what you can see when my eyes are under the microscope. And my field of view is a little bit wider than yours uh, because of the because of the camera setup. So basically, I can see, I can see the entire chip right now, whereas you can't. Um, you know, and even now, now I've moved it, I can still see the entire chip. Uh, so my zoom level is nowhere near your zoom level, and I'm actually thinking about ha adding another reduction lens to the camera, just so as you can see. Well, just so as it's less zoomed. And uh, yeah, hopefully then it'll be a bit better. So you'll notice that some of these, some of these balls here, I'm just picking up with the tweezers and just placing them down. And we're actually a few short here. I didn't get it quite enough on, so I'm just placing these in a random spot at the minute. And uh, here's a perfect example. Um, when you, so for example, I've just moved a ball from here in the middle to over there where I was working. And if you knock, the, so for example, if you knock uh, the, I don't know, these two, these two here. So you knock these two here. Don't fret over it. You know, if the worst case scenario is you're just going to have to, you know, um, wipe a couple away and then move them back into place. But what you'll tend to find is if you just take it slow and steady, you'll notice that these are actually fairly simple to move back into place. So it can be quite stressful if you do knock a few, and I do it myself. I knock, I knock these balls out of the way quite often, and I have to come back and move them into, into position. Um, and yeah, uh, here's another example. So let's say, for example, you have tried to manipulate a ball, and then what you've ended up doing, because you've tried to manipulate a ball and put it back into position, uh, what you've ended up doing is taking one ball completely off, um, and that ball is not on the edge of the chip, so it's not easily accessible. What you do in this situation, let me just straighten these ones out, and you can see how shaky my hands get sometimes. So I hope we see, yeah, that is actually coming off across on camera pretty bad. And now I'm thinking about it, they're getting worse. Um, so, alright, so they're in position. So if you, for example, knock one out of place and it's in the middle of the chip, there are two options. So the first option is going to be to just move the other chips up until you get to one that is accessible from the edge. Now obviously if you have a grid where there's you know like 10 15 balls in the way then that's not really viable. So what you do in this situation is you just take one on the edge of the tweezers and trying to be careful but also at the same time not paying too much attention just drop it into place and you'll notice that my hands have got steady again and the reason for that is because I'm using the 
the bowling jig as a kind of a guide. Or not a guide, sort of like a way to steady my hand. So I'm balancing my finger on the... On the uh, I'm balancing my middle finger on the jig itself. And what that's doing is that's creating a little bit of stability for the rest of my hand. And now my hands are so steady. Oh, actually, no, they're not. <laughs> I thought they were a bit steadier than that. Uh, but when you zoomed into the level, you can see they're actually not. Uh, but my hands, to me, in the microscope, they appear very steady. And for that reason, I'm not really paying much attention. And we're pretty much almost ready for stage two. Now, this is where it might get a little bit difficult, depending on the how the grid is arranged so if you had for example a ps4 south bridge this is going to be a ps4 apu this is going to be very difficult now what what we're about to do so what we need to do now because we haven't got enough balls on the chip itself what we're going to need to do is we're actually going to need to add some to the chip now we can't just take one individual ball from the tub every time because that's you know that's that's unviable you know if we if we had for example a hundred balls left to do I mean in this case granted we've only got you know 13 balls left to do but if we had for example a hundred then you know we're not going to be able to take one at a time so what I tend to do in this situation is I'll just slightly wet my finger and then I'll put my finger in the tub with the solder balls and what I'll do is I'll just place them just there like that. So you'll see how static kind of you know it 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 kind of drew them chips to drew them balls towards the chip and towards the uh the reboiling jig. And what I've done now is I've basically created myself a kind of little plateau of balls. So these balls are readily available for me to just come in and drop them into place and not all of them are going to stick but a lot of them will and what we can do is we can just push them down onto the chip and just push them down at will so we've basically got a little bank of of balls there which we can use to replace the balls that we are missing and we can just take what we need. So right now we only need another six balls. So I'm going to do these ones at speed. And you notice when I got to the edge of the chip there, I used the edge of the edge of the jig to my advantage so what I did was because this one was kind of stuck I kind of rubbed rubbed along the edge of the reboiling jig and what that did was that created a little bit of extra strength to get the chip off, to get the ball off the actual tweezers themselves so just straighten those up somewhat and now you'll notice that we have pretty much all of them done. However, there are a couple out of line. I'm going to leave those exactly where they are. And the reason I'm going to leave those exactly where they are is because I want to show you that they don't have to be dead center. So this one here, this this one on the edge here might be a little bit too far out. But they don't have to be perfect. Actually, no, you know what? Let's leave that there. Let's see if it is actually too far out. But I don't, it might not be. Um... Uh, I don't know. So this this one down here definitely definitely is. It's a little bit close to the other chip to the other ball. So this one here, we are going to have to come back and realign. There we go. So you'll see how simple that was to realign. Um, and the same for this one just up here. We've got a bit of debris. We had a bit of debris on there then as well. I don't know if you can see that. I think you can. 
I'm going to get rid of that debris. I don't know what that is. I think it's part of the wick. Now, one thing you can do is, uh, obviously, you can see how shaky my hands are getting there because I know I've finished the chip and I don't want to ruin it. So what you can do before you actually start this is you could put the chip inside an ultrasonic cleaner, you know, for just uh, 180 seconds or 90 seconds or something, and uh, just give it a little clean with ultrasonic uh, if you have one. Now, you can buy a cheap ultrasonic for around about £20, they're not expensive, and they really do come in handy, um, especially for this kind of thing. Uh, and also I've cleaning little boards off as well depending on the size of the cleaner. I've only got a really small one uh, I do need to buy a big one because I do want to start ultrasonic cleaning the boards after I finish working on them But uh, you'll see that all of those chips are on, all of those balls are on there now And not all of those are perfectly aligned. You can see they're in, they're in all sorts of shapes But surface tension is going to pull that in and what I'm going to do is I'm not going to use the rework station um, to to actually melt these balls so the rework station is heated up by infrared but i'm going to use hot air so i'm going to show you how to do that okay so switching back over to the overhead cam now you'll see that we've got all the balls on the actual chip itself and because there's flux on here you know we can move this around those balls aren't going aren't going anywhere not really and uh yeah obviously you know you can't you can't throw it around and things that, that would be silly but uh, but actually in terms of actually moving it, you know, if you've got enough enough room on the edge You could pick that chip up out of the stencil uh, Obviously, we want it to keep as secure as possible. So we're going to keep it in the stencil uh, Not the stencil. Sorry. I keep calling it a stencil. It's it's a jig. It's a reboiling jig uh, But yeah, we're gonna we're gonna keep that inside the jig and Basically what we're gonna do is we're gonna use hot air like I said to heat up this chip and we're going to basically melt all these solder balls into place. So, like I said earlier, we need very little airflow for this. And because these are solder balls, these have got a fairly low melting temperature. So these these ones I've got here come in quarter of a million piece tubs. And uh, obviously this is nearly empty now. And the reason this is nearly empty is not because I've done so many reballs. It's purely because I keep knocking them over. Because I've lost the tops to them. Um... And uh, I actually knocked almost a quarter of a million 0.5 millimeter balls on my table and uh, they're not fun to pick up I'll tell you that much and uh, that's another one so that's the 0.6 millimeter uh, and uh, yeah I do need to replace these because they are coming close to expiry but um, yeah these still work so you know it's, it's solder and something that's been in the ground for you know thousands of years millions of years it's and then to give it an expiry date is a bit silly, but uh, I will replace them. Uh, now these I obviously bought, these come with the jig itself, so I don't exactly know how old they are, but the guy said that he'd had them for a few months. Uh, oh, okay. July the 16th, 2010, okay. So these are 20 years out, these are 10 years out of date. <laughs> they still work. They do still work, I swear, they really do. Um... Yeah, anyway, uh, let's, uh, well, that could be 2016, I'd say. That's probably 2016, so probably, the, d the date is probably July 2016, 10th of July, I don't know. Uh, I don't really care. It's solder. It's not going to go off. Um, but, uh, yeah, let's let's get this melted, and uh, let's see, let's see how it reacts. So, like I said, we're going to need very little airflow, and we're going to need... Probably around about 360 degrees heat. Now I'm going to set mine to 400 degrees. Uh, actually, let's go 380. So I've got mine set to 380 degrees, and I'm going to set my airflow to just 20%. So I'm going to turn this on now. I'm going to wait for this to get to temperature. So, we're at 380 now, and what I'm going to do is, I'm literally going to come in, and I'm not going to go straight on the chip, you know, I'm not going to come this close to the chip, I'm not going to keep that there, I'll burn my hand off. Uh, I'm not going to come very close to it, like, like say for example that's the chip, I'm not going to come right up against this chip, you know, that would be 
a disaster. You're going to blow every single ball out of the way. What you need is you need the heat to reach the chip, but as far away as possible. So basically, you need you probably need to be around about ten inches away from the chip to be able to do it with hot air. You know, you're not going to, you're not going to come, you're not going to want to come very close to the chip. And what we're going to do is we're just going to let this heat up gradually. We're not going to heat up quickly at all. Uh, we're going to let it heat up gradually. We're going to let the air around the chip heat it up. And you can also use a the thermal coupler to, you know, get a rough idea of what the temperature is going to be on the chip itself. But what we're going to do, like I said, we're just going to heat up slowly. We're going to let that flux melt very very slowly now obviously there is some flux on the board and if we were to melt that flux rapidly it's going to wash all of those balls away so we don't want that to happen we don't want to we don't want to have a flux flood so you know we're going to want to keep as far away as possible let that flux melt and this is why i do it on an angle because then instead of being you know like this where i can't really see the chip and also where you can't see you know i can put i can put this I can put this on an, on an angle and uh, I can still see what's going on. So I can see that the flux is starting to melt now. And this is basically what we're, what we're going to do. So let's go back under the microscope now. And we'll see what's actually happening to this chip. Okay, so you can see that some of these cheap, some of these balls have slightly come out of position, and we can monitor these as close as we want if we're still under the microscope. So we we literally we're fairly far away. I'm still fairly far away, probably around about five inches away from the chip, and these are not really moving too much. Um, you know, like I said, some of these have moved a little. However. You know, I'm, I'm fairly far away from them. And what's going to happen is when these balls do eventually uh, do eventually melt, surface tension is going to pull them in. And they're going to align the self. So I think one in the corner of the top. So a third from the top on the left-hand side, I think that one's just aligned itself. So like I said, very low airflow. And we could go a little bit hotter. Um, it depends on the chip. I mean, this is a RAM chip. It's fairly sensitive to heat. So we don't want to go too hot on this. And you're going to see the balls are going to go kind of dull. That's not really an issue because I'm going to, we're going to deal with that afterwards once these are actually on the pads and actually stuck to the chip. So once we can turn the airflow up, once they're actually stuck, you know, we can we can deal with... The fact that they've gone a little bit dull and they don't look very good um, afterwards. So I'm just going to move around with the air now. So now that this is fairly warm, I'm going to turn up the heat. Um, so yeah, most chips we can probably turn up the heat to around about 420. Um, you know, you don't want full whack 480 degrees. And if you're under the microscope, what you could do, I'm going to use my right hand to hold the heat gun um, and if you're under the microscope what you could do if you are getting a little bit nervous about how close they're coming what you could do is you could just nudge some of these balls back into position I'm not going to do that because it should be fine and we can also if we're using an angled nozzle we can also manipulate the angle of this we can also manipulate the angle of this heat gun and where the heat is actually going, you know, the direction it's flowing in. We can manipulate the angle and push them back outwards. So if one of the balls, like for example, in the middle of the chip, you can see two balls are fairly close together, we could manipulate them. And we could push them back into place. I'm not going to do that. There we go. You see that? Didn't that look absolutely amazing? So all of those balls near enough 
are in position. You can see I'm not touching these balls, I'm pulling the self into place. So you see, I'm actually turning the nozzle on a slight angle now. And what's happening is that's heating up different areas. And these balls are all pulling themselves into place nicely. Just like that. Beautiful. Right, so... Now that those are all actually on the pad, I'm going to give this two minutes to, to cool down now. Because this is hot, and also because the balls are still molten, do not touch this chip, okay? This chip, if you was to touch this chip now, you're going to knock a board out. Because the chip itself, even though it takes a while to come off the board, the chip itself isn't very thick. And for that reason, it takes a long time for it to cool down in respect to um, non-melting temperatures of the solder. So what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to let it cool down until you start to see some of these balls basically go, you know, like, uh, you know, kind of a weird shape. Now, don't worry about that because we're going to deal with that, like I said. So give this a minute, let it cool down, and then we'll carry on. Right, okay, so... I've given this a minute or two to cool down, and if we take a look at the solder balls themselves now, if we give some, some of these a nudge, or if we give all of them a nudge actually, you know, I'm actually touching these balls, you can see, you can see the tweezers bumping, I'm actually touching these balls with the tweezers, and they're not moving. So these balls are now on this chip, but this chip is not technically reballed yet. There's one final thing to do. So the, these balls, they're on there, they're stuck, but they obviously don't look very good. So what we're going to do is we're going to add a bit of flux. And we can add as much flux as we want now, it doesn't matter. We're going to add some flux. So a nice river of flux there. And as you can see, I knocked that chip. Not one ball moved because they're all stuck in place. And what I'm going to do now... I'm going to put my heat gun back on, and this time I'm going to turn the temperature up. So I'm now on 60% airflow, so if I take... If I put... Uh, let's find something that's not going to damage it. So if I put this MOSFET here on top of the chip, you can see just how strong this is. I'm going, to, I'm, going to put, I'm going to come close with the... I'm going to come fairly close with the heat gun now. And it's blowing that MOSFET out of the way. So I'm not going to do it too much because I don't want to actually damage these balls. So I'm going to move that out of the way. So I'm at 60% airflow now, so that's fairly powerful. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to come in at roughly the same distance. And you'll see, this is why we call it a river of flux. And we've actually got a bit of debris here off, uh, off something. Probably off where I'll put that chip on. So I'm going to move the heat out of the way a minute. I'll just get rid of that. So I'm going to come in with the hot air now, and we're going to watch the magic. Just like that. Now let's make these balls dance a little bit. And there we go. We have a whoops. That's how powerful that, that heat was. I literally just blew that chip out of the jig with the hot air. Um and if we take a look now, because we'd because we'd left that to settle, if we take a look now, we have almost perfect balls. You know, there's there's one there's one just here, that's not quite perfect. Uh, I think that's it. That's pretty much it. And as you can see, this top left three from the left, 
you can see that one did slightly misshape because of the missing coating and that's why we would add we would add the UV mask in that situation because that would prevent that from happening however you saw clearly that these balls you know they were not they were not perfect they were not perfectly in place and you know every single one of those balls aligned absolutely perfectly uh, with the exception of you know top left number three um, every single one of those balls aligned absolutely perfectly you know if we take a look on an angle and I've got to be careful because this reboiling jig is very hot now so I'm gonna I'm gonna just hold it with a little cloth because it's really hot so be careful when you do this because it is really hot but if we look at this on an angle We have nicely rounded balls all the way across and they're absolutely beautiful and that ladies and gents is a almost almost perfectly reboiled chip so to conclude then we need a few things to reboil a chip by hand we need confidence we need a fairly steady hand, a somewhat steady hand. Uh, we need concentration. We need patience because if you're doing a large chip, it's going to take time. So you're going to need to be patient and you're going to need to be prepared to knock chips out, to knock balls out of the way. Uh, you're going to need to be prepared to struggle a little bit when you first start doing this. But uh, as you can see, that was that was literally one take, one shot, and it went absolutely perfectly because I'm used to it. And because I've been doing it for a while now and I've been practicing and that's essentially all this takes is practice and that is an absolutely beautiful looking chip that chip is ready to go back onto a board now and um, that chip is ready to make a board work now all that we'd need to do with this now is once it's cooled down a bit and now I can't stress this enough but once the balls cool, now I don't care about this one so I'm not going to leave it to cool down but once the chip has cooled down enough just get a bit of isopropyl alcohol on a cotton swab and just give it a little bit of a clean and basically what you're going to do there is just get rid of any debris and also get rid of that flux it's going to allow you to see any imperfections in the ball so like you can see this one just here now um you are going to get a little bit of fluff if you use if you do that but like i said again buy a cheap ultrasonic cleanup they're not expensive um and you're going to be able to you're going to be able to clean it properly um or just dunk it in some isopropyl alcohol you know it's not going to hurt um, and then pretty much you're ready to put that back onto a board and you don't need to buy a stencil you don't need to wait for a stencil to come it's going to get you out, out of uh, a sticky situation and it's going to help you out so um, i hope this video helped thank you ever so much for watching uh, i really enjoyed making this video i've been meaning to make it for quite some time if you do need a specific chip reboiling i do offer it as a service so depending on the size of the chip you know send me the send me a picture of the chip or send me the chip number and i'll tell you what it's going to cost um if you if you know if you're not confident and you need a chip reboarding get in touch there's going to be contact details in the description i'll do that for you obviously at a cost but i do i do, I do genuinely enjoy doing chip reballs you know i find it pretty pretty relaxing to be honest with you um and it's a nice way to unwind at the end of a busy day so um it's the same with hdmi trace repairs and things i like to do them because it, it relaxes me okay so that's going to be it for this video thanks very much for watching if you enjoyed the video be sure to hit the thumbs up button and let me know what you think down in the comment section down below if you have any questions or you need any advice just leave a comment and i will do my very best to get back to you and try and help you out as much as i can and if you do have any tips or tricks that you'd like to share leave them down in the comment section again or send me an email and i'll you know i'll include it in the description or i'll pin a comment or something like that um if you've done this kind of work before then you know i'm always open to new methods and new techniques for doing this and uh, this is just my take on it um but like i said i hope you enjoyed the video uh, leave a thumbs up if you enjoyed it leave me a comment and let me know what you think if you want to see more trying to fix videos where i attempt to repair mainly consoles but sometimes other things too and you know you know if you want to see more tutorials be sure to hit the subscribe button and turn on the bell notifications so that you're notified every time that you upload 
But thanks very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. And until next time, see you all later. Bye for now.